army have their housing problems, but they're proving again that they're equal to any occasion. At Papakura Camp, Auckland, old huts are being dismantled to provide material for something more homelike for the permanent staff and their families to live in. The man with the plans wears a uniform and the men he's directing are soldiers too. It's an all-army effort covering all permanent camps in the country. Each house is a 10 weeks job for a qualified carpenter and six trainees. The men are learning a useful trade and at the same time they're helping to make their own camps more comfortable and attractive. The materials are first class and so is the workmanship. Captain Edwards, in charge of the army housing scheme, instructs a Maori trainee in the finer points of bricklaying. Houses permanent staff for the use of. They're all different in design, layout and colour, and they're equipped inside with kitchen facilities, bookcases and other fittings. They're a credit to the men who are building them, and a credit to the Army's initiative. Near Palmerston North, a training farm has been established for disabled servicemen. Here they live during their two-year course in small farming. Purchased by the government, this farm is now maintained by the Disabled Servicemen's Re-Establishment League. The men have training periods at each type of farming. Next week it may be his turn for a bit of down-to-earth work. Activities include market gardening, dairy, pig, fruit and poultry farming. According to their disabilities, the trainees are allotted suitable jobs. The type of farm a man's given at the end of training depends on his adaptability for any particular work. This kiwi looks as though he's handled a chick or two. Re-establishment of disabled servicemen aids another campaign. Full instruction in dairying means a little extra butter to swell Britain's meagre ration. Feeding time. Just rattle the bucket and the calves are in, hoofs and all. An important item is the heavier work of spreading lime and fertilizer, which is undertaken by the fitter men. Another day finished, and a day closer to that little farm of his own. At Sumner, near Christchurch, is the special school for the education of the deaf. Outwardly, it's like any other school, and the children, except that they're nearly all stone deaf, just like any other boys and girls. Teaching them, however, is a special problem, for when they first come here at the age of five, they are, on account of their deafness, dumb as well. More than half of the pupils board at the school, and for ten months of the year, this is their home. Though no boarding school can make up for a home, these children get all the affection that teachers and house staff can give them. At this school, the one great object is to overcome the handicap of deafness to teach the children not only to understand the other people by lip reading, but to talk as well. When they come here, they've never spoken a word. Lip reading comes first.
Of this lesson, the rest of the class hear nothing. They have ears, but live in a world of silence. Their eyes have to make up for their ears. After lip reading comes speech. The breath on the back of the hand gives the idea of how air is expelled when speaking. At eight or nine, these children are learning fast but they're still a long way behind normal children. Not only have they had a late start, but they have more to learn. Speech lessons take up a lot of extra time. When the teacher wants Nanette for a reading lesson, she has to tap her desk to attract her attention. In all classes, a great deal of individual teaching is necessary. At 15 and 16, they've largely overcome their disability. They can lip read fluently, and most of them can talk well. What do you call it when rain washes away the soil? Mervyn? Erosion. Good. And how can we prevent it, Stanley? By planting trees. Yes, that's right. And what are the best trees to plant? Willows. Well, uh, now all say willows. Willows. Again? Willows. By this time, they're beginning to think of what they can do when they leave school. Confident that they can fend for themselves, they can look forward to leading useful and almost normal lives. Skilled trades will attract many of them, though obviously some occupations will not be possible. On sport, they're particularly keen. The School for the Deaf has long been well known for its records in school tournaments. Even when you're five, deafness need be no bar to happiness. Being unable to talk, these infants have difficulty in organizing themselves, so teachers are on hand to help them out. Such care and attention along with skill and patience, is what they'll have all their school days. So like all those who've preceded them, they will, when they grow up, gratefully remember the school for the deaf. <laughs>